Dr. Ziska, we're here at the PEC conference, uh, a workshop really on climate change and, and its impacts. You've done a little bit of work, uh, I guess more than a little bit, on the impact of climate change on agriculture. Can you tell me a little bit about your findings and how you think uh, climate change would affect agriculture in Pennsylvania? Let me give a little bit about my background first. I'm a plant physiologist uh, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I've been working on the climate change issue for the last 15 years or so. Um, when you look at climate change, what people mean by that are really two things. One is we know that the gases that we're adding to the atmosphere are going to increase surface temperatures. The increase in surface temperatures is likely to be more in the winter than in the summer. But some of these gases, in particular carbon dioxide, are also a source of carbon for plant growth. So both temperature and carbon dioxide will have indirect and direct effects on agriculture. Now, agriculture is the number one industry in Pennsylvania. And within that industry, dairy is one of the big um, factors within uh, Pennsylvania agriculture. When you start looking at dairy, one of the things you note is that cows do not like heat. They don't do well. So when temperatures get above about 72, 73 degrees Fahrenheit, milk production falls off. So what we project is with increasing CO2 by the end of the century, that milk production in Pennsylvania could drop by as much as 10 to 20 percent, particularly in the southern part of Pennsylvania. Now, can farmers adapt to that? Yes, they can. They can add systems to their dairy farm that will uh, allow the cows to be cooled. You can add air conditioning, you can add uh, uh, water, and uh, mists, and so forth. But again, that has a differential impact if you're a big farmer as opposed to if you're a small farmer. Now let's look at some other things, particularly with respect to crops. Now when you start looking at tree crops, apples are one of the things that come to mind when you think of Pennsylvania, particularly things like Macintosh. In fact, the, um, the Museum of Apple Industry is here uh, in Pennsylvania. One of the things that apples need is in fact a chilling requirement over the winter. And what we see is, and what we have been seeing already, is that as the winters warm, that chilling requirement is falling out. And as a result of that, apple production in Pennsylvania and New York is also declining. And that's sort of the bad news. The good news is that other warm season crops seem to be adapting to it. For example, if you start looking at the grape industry, uh, particularly some of the European varietal grapes, that threshold temperature at which they start to uh, be affected has gone above that, that sort of critical limit so that grapes are no longer in, uh, in peril of showing any sort of detrimental effects because of really cold winters. So the grape industry is, is likely to take off, and as other warm season crops, melons and so forth, could also take off. Now the downside of that is as you change these temperatures, you also change where not just the things that you want to have grow uh, come in, but also things that you don't necessarily want to have will come in as well. Uh, for example, uh, invasive weeds like kudzu, which heretofore have been sort of below the Mason-Dixon line as a result of the cold keeping them out. As that cold changes and as it becomes warmer, then essentially you're, limit, you're lifting the limit on where these weeds will grow. Not only just the weeds, but things like um, the emerald ash borer and other pests and diseases are likely to move north as well. Think of it this way. When you plant uh, a seed in your garden, you always look at the back of the package of seed and you see this sort of uh, hardiness zone. And you say, well, I'm in zone four, I'm in zone five. Well, those zones are shifting northward. And not just the plants that you want to have around, the desirable plants, but the undesirable plants will also shift as well. So while we anticipate some benefits with respect to what could grow in Pennsylvania, we also see some negative effects with respect to weeds and pests and diseases that will also uh, change as a result of that. Now, one of the questions I'm always asked is, well, is this really an issue? Because, well, heck, you spray them more or you increase your dosage. But one of the things we're finding is that as you change things like carbon dioxide, you also affect the hardiness of these weeds, that it becomes much harder to control by chemical means. Now, can you still control them? Yes, but that means you have to increase the frequency of spraying or you have to increase the dosage. There's a cost to that. There's a, obviously an environmental cost, but there's also an economic cost to farmers. So again, uh, there's a certain amount of impact here, but that impact will be mollified to a certain degree by the degree of resources that the farmer has. If you're, if you're a multi-corporation farmer and you have a lot of resources, the impact may not be as great as if you're a small sort of family-owned farm. We see that there are some potential benefits with warming, but what we tend to see is that those benefits may be offset 
by the changes in carbon dioxide and temperature that may also occur. And let me give you sort of a simple example. We know that carbon dioxide is a resource. I mentioned that the, the second effect is that CO2 stimulates the growth of plants. And one of the things that's been brought forward um, is that, well, because of that, that will offset any sort of negative impact with respect to warming. But keep in mind this, that when you change a resource, whether that resource is water or sunlight or nutrients or carbon dioxide, you not only affect the plants that you want to have grow more, but you in fact also affect the undesirable plants, the weeds. Now for every crop that's grown in the United States, there are usually eight to nine different weed species that are associated with that crop. When I change a resource, again, what's gonna happen? Now let me give you a, a typical example. There was a Pennsylvania corn farmer back in the 1950s that decided, somewhat logically, that he knew that his weeds and his corn competed for nitrogen. Now back in the 1950s, nitrogen was very cheap. So he said, you know what? I'm gonna add 10 times more nitrogen than I need to the soil. That way there'll be plenty of nitrogen for the weeds and there'll be plenty of nitrogen for the corn. So he did that and what happened? His corn disappeared. Why? Because the weeds are much more effective at taking that nitrogen and growing more than the corn was. The corn was simply outcompeted. It's not that corn can't respond to nitrogen, it's just that the weeds respond so much more. So when we look at what happens with CO2, again, CO2 is, an, uh, is also a resource, what we find is that weeds typically tend to outcompete the crops and in fact, yields go down. So that's a concern for us with respect to looking at weed crop competition and also with respect to how are we gonna control these weeds in the future. Good, thanks very much for your overview. Sure.